Oi vei! What a show today! Hanukkah, it's not a Jewish Christmas. Hey, don't change the channel. I know this stuff is different, but don't worry. Your average, regular kind of Christian TV will return later. In the meantime, I want to offer you something special. Welcome to our Hanukkah season edition of Crosstalk. In case you wondered, my name is Randy Weiss. I'm a Jewish guy that snuck into the traditionally boring mix of Christian television. Right now, some of you are saying, oh joy, a Jew. And if I have any Jewish viewers, you may be thinking, oh boy, give me a goy. By the way, a goy is a non-Jew. I mean no disrespect to Gentile viewers. Goy is just a kind of code word that we use. You know, it sort of goes with the secret handshake, you know, that we Jewish guys use. Hey, I'm just kidding. I really don't want to frustrate my non-Jewish viewers, and God forbid I should offend any of my Jewish friends. But, oy vey, what a show today! The title of today's program is Hanukkah, It's Not a Jewish Christmas. Now, if you're interested in Jewish history and the Jewish connection to the early church, you might think about getting a free printed copy of my Hanukkah research. My address is on the screen. Write me today, and I'll explain more about it a bit later. When the program is done, feel free to go talk to your rabbi, talk to your priest, or maybe your shrink. But I promise you, Hanukkah will never be the same. Now, I assume most of you have heard about Hanukkah, but few Jews and fewer Christians really know the true story of Hanukkah. Actually, it is pronounced Chanukah. <laughs> Did you ever wonder why most Hebrew words sound like someone is clearing their throat? Well, I can't answer that. But if you've ever mustered up the chutzpah, the nerve to ask, what the heck is Hanukkah? For this, I have an answer. Hanukkah is the festival of lights. The great ancient Jewish historian Josephus gave us that name. You know, this is a menorah. Uh, it's a candlestick. It's the type that's used to light up the festival. It's also called a Chanukiah. It's a menorah. <laughs> Hanukkah is the Hebrew word for dedication. It commemorates the purification and rededication of the temple after the Maccabees led a successful revolt against the wicked Syrian invaders. The Maccabees were sort of like the first family of Jewish revolutionaries. An old priest named Mattathias Maccabee, along with his five sons, led a small group of guerrilla warriors into the most heralded Jewish revolt of antiquity. It was the quintessential upset victory of ancient history, the classic underdog story with a Jewish hero. In the traditional account, Judah Maccabee, a.k.a. the Hammer, is portrayed as the Jewish version of George Washington. In other words, Judah, our bold, brash hero, rose to the foreground from among a suffering, oppressed people. Through daring bravery, military skill, and personal charisma, he won freedom for my people in ancient Judaism. The big difference between the Maccabean revolt and most political struggles is that God was credited with the Jewish victory. And let's face it, God makes a much better hero than George Washington. Now, ultimately, history reveals the old maxim to be true. Power corrupts, and you know the rest of the story. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. The Maccabean success is no different. The Hanukkah victory was the beginning of the Hasmonean dynasty. Did you know that this led to the beginning of the famous Jewish sect known as the Pharisees? In a moment, I'll help you make the connection. Until then, I want to ask a provocative question. Can modern ultra-Orthodox Jews, called Hasidim, justly compare themselves to the ancient Hasidim of pre-Christian Israel? Now, just so 
It doesn't frost your pumpkin. I'll also explain another ancient Jewish connection to the early church. If this stuff is of interest, I've got more. Let's do a little history, okay? I want you to understand an important connection between the Hasmonean dynasty and our own New Testament. The Hasmoneans represented a brief time in Jewish history when my people finally enjoyed independence and religious freedom, nearly 150 years before Jesus entered the scene under Roman rule. The Jews, known as the Hasidim, began even earlier and influenced the successful revolt that brought our freedom. From a New Testament vantage point, Christians should understand that many scholars believe that the Pharisees, or as they were known in Hebrew during the time of Jesus, the Purushim, likely developed from the earlier Jewish group known as the Hasidim. Now the term literally means the pious ones. Most of you are familiar with modern images of Hasidic Jews. We think of bearded men in long black coats with strange hats and curly flowing sideburns known as payases. Now, For the record, I think it is inappropriate to compare or equate the ancient Hasidim, who lived centuries before Jesus, with their modern counterparts among the stereotypical hyper-religious ultra-Orthodox Jews. I do not believe it is intellectually honest to link modern Jews to the Hasidic movement directly to the ancient Hasidim of pre-Christian Israel. If we, as modern Jews, are honest with ourselves, the rituals and practices of biblical Judaism are not recognizable when compared to our modern Jewish experience. I'm sorry, but Hasidic Jews may wish to lay claim to the authority of their ancient namesakes, but their practices are so different that it seems awkward to assume the name. Modern Rabbinic Judaism has long since been overhauled. Ancient Judaism depended upon the Levitical priesthood. In First and Second Temple era Judaism, the Levites were fundamental to the expressions of our faith. In modernity, the Levites are little more than incidental, a footnote, if you will, to one's identity in 21st century Judaism. Ancient Jewish practices revolved around the sacrificial system. And that very concept would be an of, just be an offense. I mean, it would just be unacceptable in many modern Jewish circles. The temple provided the framework for many of the sacrificial requirements of ancient Judaism. And trust me, some modern Jews would call the ASPCA to protect the poor defenseless animals before any overzealous Levite could, you know, slit the throat of the first goat to be sacrificed. The Levites just wouldn't get away with it today. The synagogue, though ancient in concept, can never truly replace the temple service. The simple fact is that modern Hasidic Jewish groups have, you know, they're a very recent uh, event in, in the history of Judaism. Many of today's ultra-Orthodox sects can be traced to Eastern European Judaism that developed in fairly modern history. During the same recent time period that our American Revolution was brewing, a revolution in Jewish thinking was happening in Poland. And this is the comparatively brief history of our modern Hasidim. According to a simple Merriam-Webster dictionary, today's version of Hasidic Jews are deemed to be a Jewish mystical sect founded in about 1750. In comparison, the original Hasidim have their roots before the Hasmonean dynasty that flourished more than a century before Christ. Another interesting distinction lies in the fact that modern Eastern European Hasidic Jews were originally considered to be a dangerous rebel group of fringe fanatics. They were strongly opposed by what were called the Mitnagdim, their more mainline Jewish opponents. And it seems to me that a much more recent medieval Hasidic mysticism has replaced that far more ancient form of Judaism practiced by the original Hasidim, who only coincidentally carry the same name. So, like it or not, today's Hasidim must admit that 2,000 years and a very different set of religious beliefs and practices separate these two distinct forms of Judaism. Perhaps, 
the most noticeable similarity between ancient Hasidim and their distant modern counterpart is that they both built dynasties that led to control and excesses in Israel. But this program is not going to become a socio-political commentary or a discourse on manipulative influences in modern Israel by the ultra-Orthodox minority. Rather, it is about the true story of Hanukkah. And to understand this story, we need to time travel back nearly two centuries before the rise of Christianity. The trip is worthwhile because it will set the stage for the birth of the church. The original Hasidim rejected Greek rule, and they gloriously helped bring military success to the Maccabees. Nevertheless, Jewish independence was short-lived. The temporary condition of legitimate Jewish home rule only lasted until the Roman Empire took over. And Rome limited Jewish control shortly before the time of Christ. This is the Jewish world into which Jesus was born. Judaism had been molded between the hammer in Greece and the anvil of Rome. First century Jews could still taste the victory of Hanukkah and their brief era of independence during the Hasmonean dynasty. So think of it like this. Hanukkah celebrated a spectacular Jewish victory over pagan Greek rulers. This was very meaningful to a Jewish world which was then dominated by pagan Roman rulers. The names and Uniforms were different, but in a sense, it was the same old stuff, if you know what I mean. We must all recognize that this was the atmosphere that gave rise to the Christian gospel. And this all bears witness to a fact I try to pound home for my non-Jewish viewers, namely that Jewish history and the early church are inseparable. If you want to know more about Christianity, you need to understand ancient Judaism because ancient Jews were the bricks and blocks of the early church of whom our Jewish Savior was the chief cornerstone. There are many reasons why Hanukkah is one of my favorite Jewish holidays, but did you know that you can scour the Jewish Bible till the page numbers wear off and you won't find, I'm, I'm serious, you won't find Hanukkah with a magnifying glass. On the other hand, if you knew where to look, you might find it in the Christian Bible. Do I have your attention? If you're Jewish, you might wonder why Hanukkah was left out of your Bible. And if you're a Christian, you might wonder why it's hiding out in your Bible. The Hanukkah story, in a proverbial nutshell, is a small band of Jewish freedom fighters successfully, they drove out a, a, a vastly superior army of foreign oppressors. The annual celebration retells the story for ongoing generations of Jews to remember. Many Gentiles just assume that Hanukkah is our way of competing with Christmas. I promise you, it's not. Hanukkah is one of the best documented ancient celebrations within Judaism. And I want to clarify a, a few important points about the holiday. Today, I want you to have the cold, hard facts about what Hanukkah is and what it is not. Hanukkah is not a Jewish Christmas. Hanukkah is not a particularly holy, holy day. In fact, Hanukkah is not even a biblical holiday. Like most Jewish kids, I grew up enjoying Hanukkah more than any other Jewish festival. But the Festival of Lights is not a somber, reverent holiday like Yom Kippur, our Day of Atonement. In spite of the fact that the rabbis classify Hanukkah as a minor festival, many Jewish children still place it at the top of the list. And prior to the break, I told you that Hanukkah is not in the Jewish Bible. Well, there's a very good reason for this fact. Actually, you might feel a little bit silly after I explain the reason. It's not found in the Jewish scriptures because the event did not take place until several hundred years after the last book of the Hebrew Bible was written. Our Bible was finished before Hanukkah happened. I'm sorry, 
But the first celebration actually took place during the intertestamental era. Okay, the word intertestamental may sound complex, but it's a simple thing to understand. Just like interstate trade describes trade between two or more states, or an interface serves as a link or a connection between two devices, the intertestamental era is the time period between the two testaments of the Bible. This era is often described as the silent years. Some believe that more than 400 years passed without biblical revelation. Hanukkah is a product of those silent centuries between the finish of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament. Therefore, the Hebrew Bible is silent about Hanukkah. I'm sorry, but the canon of Jewish scripture was already closed. In other words, the approved list of books in the Jewish Bible was already completed. Thank God that the Christian church, for it was the Christian church, and it's to the credit of the churchmen, that they faithfully preserved the literature about Hanukkah for the world. Actually, the story is well documented, but the location of the evidence might shock a few of you. A lot of the details are right here in my King James Bible. Now, earlier I asked a riddle. When is a Bible like a stolen car? Now would be a good time to answer that riddle. So, back around 1969, my car was stolen. By the time the police found it, my fine Plymouth GTX was completely stripped. No more mag wheels, no more Ram Air, no more 8-track stereo, and most disturbing, no more born-to-be-wild 8-track tape. Well, a Bible is like a stolen car when it has parts missing. Okay, you might be asking, when are there parts missing from a Bible? Well, that depends on who you ask. If you ask a Protestant, the Jewish Bible is missing the New Testament. If you ask a Catholic, the Protestant Bible is missing the Apocrypha. Guess what? I've been reading the Hanukkah story right here in this old King James Bible, and I found this one in a flea market for about 75 cents quite a long time ago, but I mean, it must be valid. Yes, sir, it says so right here. The Holy Bible containing the Old and New Testaments, translated out of the original tongues and with the former translations diligently compared and revised by His Majesty's special command, appointed to be read in the churches, authorized King James Version. This old Bible is real interesting. It goes right from Malachi, noting it to be the end of the prophets, and begins on the next page with the first book of the Apocrypha. It runs through the Apocrypha without missing a beat and starts directly into the Gospel of Matthew, the first book of the New Testament. Ha have I just shocked a few of you? I love the Bible. That's why I'm a Bible teacher. I like new translations and old versions. I like study Bibles, chain reference editions. I like parallel Bibles, and paraphrased Bibles. I love God's Word and believe it's a valuable tool in every form that it can be disseminated. I love the Word of God. And now, as related to differing versions, personally, I often read the King James Bible. I don't just you know, think that it's something better. I just like it. And, and I don't think one version is necessarily so much greater than the other version. I like all of them. Uh, well, let me restate that. I like all versions of the real Bible. I don't like the fake ones. When I have textual or doctrinal questions, I like to consult several translations. And I also like to refer back to the original Hebrew when I'm in doubt about a text. But this edition of Crosstalk is not about the propriety of new translations. I want to talk about this old Bible that's right here in my hands. Actually, I have several old King James Bibles like this one. 
This King James Bible contains the Apocrypha. You might not know it, but it was normal in earlier generations to have the Apocrypha included in most King James Bibles. A major segment of Christianity still includes the apocryphal works in their Bibles today. I guess you should understand that although it's a Jewish book, the Apocrypha has never been canonized into our Jewish scriptures. Does that make it unimportant? Absolutely not. These ancient writings are very important. I don't want anyone to be confused, and I don't believe that they are inspired, but I do think that we should all be familiar with their content. They're one of the finest sources of ancient history available predating the New Testament. Without the books of Maccabees found in these writings, we would not know much about Hanukkah. Well, I'm, I'm not going to suggest that you need to read the Apocrypha instead of the Bible, and nor do I believe that the Apocrypha is on the same inspired level as the Word of God. Nevertheless, there is great reason to own and read the Apocrypha. I mean, if you want to be more like Jesus, you should want to read the things Jesus would have read. And someday Jesus is going to return. The Bible says that. And at that time, we shall be like him. Perhaps we could be more like him right now if we just did some of the things that he did. If you want to be like him, maybe you should consider some of the celebrations that Jesus celebrated. It might change the way you think about Jesus, Jews, and the Jewishness of the early church. Now, please don't be confused. Jewish observances will not purchase your salvation. It can only come through the finished work of the cross, but that does not negate the value and beauty of the Jewish practices that Jesus followed. Do you know how Jesus viewed the Apocrypha? Do you know what Jesus thought about Hanukkah? In our next edition, I'll conclusively prove that Jesus read the Apocrypha, the disciples read the Apocrypha, and Jesus celebrated Hanukkah. Come back next time for a special segment in our Hanukkah Christmas video series. We'll also explore some of the ancient literature that Jesus and the disciples read that have probably never been read on Christian TV. If you want the straight scoop, don't miss it.